This is episode five of my free CCNA course. And a huge shout out to Boson Software, the official sponsor of this CCNA course. They are the reason this can be made available for free. So I highly encourage you to go check them out. They have the absolute best CCNA, CCMP, labs and practice exams. When you watch a YouTube video like this one, what happens? What's happening in the network? In this video, we're gonna find out. We're gonna focus on the upper layers of the OSI model, the application, presentation, session, and transport layers, and see what happens when we try to watch a YouTube video. Let's get started. In our last video, Johnny needed copy bad. And we watched how his internet traffic, his network traffic, would go across a network, across the internet, and get to networkchuck.coffee where you could place an order for delicious coffee. And it is good, trust me. We dive deep into the OSI model, a model that describes how a network can work. And we watched as Johnny's computer took his application data and threw it down the layers of the OSI model, going from segment to packet to frame, a process we call encapsulation. And then it fired electrical signals, it probably doesn't make that sound, across the physical wire, going across the network, the internet, until it finally arrives at networkchuck.coffee, a server that hosts the website. And here the process is actually reversed, going from frame to packet to segment, a process we call de-encapsulation. And this whole process is amazing. But up until now, we focused hard on the network, data link, and physical layers. We haven't spent much time in the upper layers, application, presentation, session, and transport. Until now, we're gonna look at all that right now. If you've watched the previous videos, you should have a basic understanding of a switch and a router and what it does when your internet traffic hits it. If you don't know what that is, then go back and watch those videos. But now we're going up. And Johnny already has his coffee. He's already ready to go. Now he wants to watch some YouTube videos. So we're going to pop the hood a bit and see what happens when Johnny's web browser tries to access YouTube and how the application presentation session and transport layers are involved. You might need some coffee for this. Take Johnny's advice. Let's take a look at the application layer first. So Johnny fires up his web browser and he begins to type in YouTube.com. And this is where the OSI model comes into play, the application layer. And also keep in mind, this does apply to the TCP IP model, the model we actually use, which is the same as this, except we don't use the presentation and session in that model. But the concept of these layers does not go away in the TCP IP model, which is why we're going to talk about them right now. And the application layer is kind of the portal, an interface for a program on your computer that needs a network, like your web browser or a video game that you play online. If that application needs to interface with a network, it's going to engage the application layer of the OSI model. It's sort of the gateway to the next two layers, the presentation and session layer. So Johnny's web browser takes the data it wants to send to YouTube.com, which in this case would be like, hey, I want to see your site. So it'd be a get request, get me that stuff. And it sends it down to the presentation layer where we get it prettied up. Time to get it dolled up and ready to go. What does that mean? Well, the presentation layer is responsible for making it presentable. Two of the main things it's going to be worried about is data format and encryption. Now, data format, what does that mean? One way to think about data formats is to think about file types. Let's say I send you a document. It's called mydocument.pdf. When you try to open that document at your computer, what happens? Well, it opens because you've got programs and applications that know how to use PDF documents. That's the data format. Adobe Acrobat, even most browsers can open up PDF documents no problem. It's a common format that we've all agreed to use for things like this. But if I were a weirdo and I put my data in a format that no one even knew about, like .network chuck, and I sent that to your computer, your computer would be like, um, I don't know how to view, I don't know what this is. So that's why we have these file types, these data formats, things that we all pretty much agreed, we're gonna put things into this format so we can all kind of play with and read. And with web browsers, what's a file type we see all the time? HTML. The presentation layer would take our data and put it in a format that we all pretty much understand put that to a .html file. And when YouTube does send me a .html file, it knows how to open that. That's what the presentation layer does. So HTML, XML, JPG, you know, a uh, image data type, image data format. That's what the presentation layer does. We can also use encryption at the presentation layer, making sure our data that's being sent back and forth can't be seen by, well, hackers. Uh, a common one you might see is SSL. Secure socket layer, that's done at the presentation layer. So once the presentation layer is done with our data, he's made it look pretty, putting it into the right format. He may have encrypted it so someone can't see it. We then move on down to session. The job of the session is to open up the communication, to start the conversation between the web browser, Johnny's application here, and the YouTube server. And make sure things have been authenticated, make sure conversation is smooth. Now keeping in mind, all this stuff is still going through all the other layers. And a bunch of things are happening here, but logically, the session keeps the communication open. And what I mean by that is that at the lower layers, at the network layer, we're going through routers, at the data link layer, we're going through switches, all kinds of crazy stuff is happening down there. But to the session layer, 
It's one conversation. Let's keep this thing going. And when it's done, he tears it down, ending the conversation. And the session layer does this for any communication that the application has with anything else. Maybe it's not just the web browser talking. Maybe you have Spotify running, talking to the Spotify server. It's managing all those different sessions on your computer. Some popular protocols you might see at the session layer are L2TP or the layer two tunneling protocol. You'll see this a lot with VPN connections. We've got RTCP, the remote transport control protocol, which this actually helps set up phone calls. And speaking of phone calls, video calls, the H.245 protocol, which helps set up video calls. And of course, proxies. We have these socks proxies operating at this layer. When you're trying to hide yourself as a hacker or just as a person who values their privacy, you will use a SOX proxy, which operates at this layer to bounce between different hosts to kind of muddy up who you are. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is one of the most popular protocols you'll see at that session layer. Now, at this point, we've covered the application layer and what it does at a high level view. Application presentation session, keeping in mind that all of these are just one layer in the TCP IP model, just the application layer. So we get the data ready, we pretty it up, put it in the right format, encrypt it maybe, and then we get the communication started. We start talking to somebody, we get that session open. But in order for that session to actually open up, we have to send it down the other layers. And now we're at the transport layer. We're getting somewhere, literally. The transport layer is where people who love networking start to pay attention. Application layer? Nah, that's for programmers. Wait, did you say transport? Now you got my attention. This is where we operate. The session layer sends our data down to the transport layer, and now we're worried about, hey, how can we get this data to the other end, to the other server? This is kind of like sending a, a package to someone. Like, let's say I want to send a package to you. And at the application layer, I'm going, okay, I want to send this and then this cable, this pen, and this coffee mug full of coffee. Um, then I'm going to put it into a box. I'm going to make it all pretty, get tape it together. Okay, done. Now, how do I get it to you? I got to send it to the next layer, which might be shipping. Do I use UPS? Do I use USPS? Do I use FedEx? DHL? Who's going to take it for me? What method am I going to choose? How am I going to transport it? Transport layer, ha, see that? And with the transport layer, instead of choosing a shipping carrier, we're going to choose a protocol. There are two main transport protocols we focus on. There are others, but these are the two main ones we see all the time. We got TCP, probably heard of that guy, and UDP, probably heard of that guy. And at this point, we have to ask ourselves a question. And when I say us, I mean like the web browser or the application. Do we want our data to get there really, really fast? Or do you want it to get there safely and make sure it actually gets there? If we want it fast, it's going to be UDP. If we want to make sure it reliably gets there, it's going to be TCP. Let's take a look at TCP first. Let's say we do want to get our stuff there reliably. The reason it's so reliable is because TCP is kind of naggy. <laughs> what I mean is that when TCP is communicating, let's say YouTube sends me a file, like an HTML file, like maybe it's the homepage, so homepage.html. Before it sends me anything else, it waits to see if I got it. It's like, okay, did he get it? And if I don't say anything back, he's like, hey, uh, Johnny, here it is again. Did you get it? And he waits for me to say, yes, YouTube, I got it. And then he'll continue to send me more data. But it's that verification process, that reliability, that makes TCP pretty cool. It makes sure your data is received. And if it doesn't receive a confirmation that you got it, it'll send that sucker again. And another reason that TCP is reliable is that before we even begin to send data to each other, we have to get to know each other first. So YouTube will go, hey, um, I want to send you something, Johnny, but I have to make sure we're friends first. Let's do a three-way handshake. And that's what it's called the TCP three-way handshake, which is all about setting up that connection before we start exchanging data, which works like this. YouTube will say, hey, Johnny, how you doing? My name's YouTube, which we'll call a synchronization message. Johnny will respond and say, well, well great to meet you, YouTube. This will be our sin ack message. And then YouTube responds with a ack, <laughs> which sin means synchronization, ack means acknowledgement. And once this formality's out of the way, then they can communicate with each other, but this has to happen. And so this is a bit more involved. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> uh, TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol with a strong emphasis on control because it wants to control every bit of that communication. Whereas UDP, it's a little crazy. Do you want to know why UDP is fast? Because it just doesn't care. It doesn't care if you get the message. It doesn't care if you get the package. It's just going to keep on sending stuff. It doesn't wait for verification. It just goes blah. Here you go. 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 Here you go, here you go. Ah, crap. <laughs> it just sends, sends, sends. So know how you doing? Nice to meet you? No, YouTube just bleh, sends and sends. Doesn't wait for verification. And hopefully you get it all. So now when Johnny's trying to watch a YouTube video, which one is used? TCP or UDP? Both. <laughs> it's actually using both. Check this out. I'm going to fire up Wireshark, which is a tool we can use to capture our real network traffic. So watch this. It's awesome. I'm going to start capturing on one of my interfaces here. And look at all that. It's it's just a ton of stuff. So it's capturing everything. Now I'm going to go off and watch a YouTube video. Let's go. This 
Boom. All right, let's pause that and let's take a look at Wireshark and see what happened. Let me stop this capture here. Now I captured all my internet traffic and my computer is talking to a lot of things all at once. So I need to filter that a bit. Now this looks crazy. I know a lot of stuff going on, but we'll break down just a few things here. First of all, this IP address right here, 173.194.191.167, that is the IP address of YouTube. So when I open up my web browser and I hit that URL, that's what I was going to. Notice the source is my IP address right here, destination is YouTube, and look at the protocol. We're using TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, reliability. And notice, here's the three-way handshake right here. I got my SIN, my, hello, how you doing? My SIN ACK from YouTube, I'm doing fine, I'm YouTube. And then the ACK from me. And then of course, a lot more stuff going on down here. But I wanna scroll down and show you something else. I said we're using both, and I wasn't lying to you. If you scroll down a bit, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things going on. We'll keep scrolling, 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 scrolling until I finally made it here. Okay, cool. <laughs> Notice it went from TCP and it changed everything to UDP. Still talking to YouTube. It's still me talking to YouTube right here. But the protocol switched over to UDP. Why? Well, when Johnny sent his request to watch a YouTube video, and obviously I'm changing myself to Johnny now, YouTube doesn't just send a video, but it sends a web page as well. So like we look back at the web page here. It's loading all kinds of stuff. Like we got the menu right here. We got suggested videos over here, sign in stuff, buttons, graphics, all kinds of stuff. This is all just a regular web page. In fact, if we look at the developer tools, which you can do in any web browser, we can see that it is indeed an HTML document. So YouTube sends the HTML file and along with other stuff to build out this web page, but then it starts to play the video. This is when it switches from TCP to UDP to send data. But why does that video need UDP? Why couldn't it just use TCP? I mean, what's wrong with having reliable transportation for a video? Well, think about when you're watching a video, like let's say this video right now. With UDP, you're just getting this data. Bam, 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 bam. The video's coming at you. You might miss a few of those packets. So let's do a clip, for example. Let's say I go, mmm, that is delicious coffee. But maybe your internet connection's bad and you drop a few packets. So it might look like this. Mmm, there's coffee. Now that's not great because you missed something. So you might think, well, we can prevent this from happening by using TCP, right? It'll make sure you get stuff. It sounds good in theory, but here's what would happen. Mmm, there's coffee. That is delicious. You see, for real-time applications like that, watching a video, watching a live stream, gaming online, it doesn't make sense to resend the same thing because once that thing's missed, it does no good to get it later. I mean, this has happened to you before, right? Like you're playing an online game, you're running, maybe your internet connection drops for a second, and you're suddenly 15 feet ahead. It would make zero sense to try and have that data sent back to you and throw you back 15 steps so you could walk that hallway no, you'd already be dead because someone shot you up there. So TCP is great and it's used for most things that don't require that real time interaction. But when we need to have things quickly and fast and we're retransmitting things, which would not make sense, that's where UDP comes in. Now there's one more thing I wanna to touch on with the transport layer in TCP and UDP. And it's these numbers right here, 443 and then 57095. They're crazy important, but what are they? Let me show you a problem we might have if we didn't have those numbers, which we call ports, but we'll cover what those are in a minute. When we want to watch a YouTube video, we have to access their server, which means we have to go over the internet and hit their IP address. This will be using the HTTP protocol. And in pretty much all cases now, the HTTPS for secure protocol. But what if that YouTube server wasn't just doing a website? What if it also had FTP, a file transfer protocol server? What if it had SSH and RDP? both protocols that we can use to access a server remotely. So if I wanted to SSH and log into the command line of that YouTube server, how do I tell it that? <laughs> how do I go to the IP address and say, I want to SSH and not just, I want to watch a video. That is what those port numbers are for. If we look back at Wireshark where we captured our network traffic, look at this first message, which is from me to the YouTube server. I'm using the TCP protocol and here's the from port. We'll talk about that here in a moment, but the to port, is 443. You may already know that port 443 is the port that's commonly used for HTTPS. So in your web browser, when you type in HTTPS YouTube.com, you're saying you want to access this server IP address on port 443. It could also look like this, the IP address with a colon after that and the port. So I want to access that server, that IP address on port 443. Those ports allow us to run multiple services on one server. So one server can be a ton of things. It could be RDP server, SSH server, FTP server, web server, gaming server. You can open up other ports, other windows into your server. And no, I'm not talking about Windows server. <laughs> it could be Linux, I don't know. Another well-known port you might know about is port 21. Port 21 is commonly used as FTP, SSH 22, RDP 3389, 
If you go to Google and just type in common ports, you'll get a ton of information. I'll give this Wikipedia article real quick. And uh, if we scroll down here, notice we have our port numbers here in one column, and then we have TCP and UDP. Some ports are only TCP or just UDP or can use either or. And notice as I scroll down, there are a ton, <laughs> just a ton. In fact, we have available ports zero through 65,535. But as far as these well-known ports, which are listed below, ports zero through 1,023 are reserved for those. Now you don't have to memorize all of them, but it is important to learn the key ports. Ports that you'll see used a lot. So 22 for SSH, 23 for Telnet, 25 for SNMTP, port 80 for HTTP, 115 for SMTP, 123 for NTP. So just a lot of stuff out there. So looking back at Wireshark, we got this destination port of 443. We know what that's for. It's for HTTPS. We're accessing the web server of YouTube. Awesome. But then what's this big number over here? 57,095? Obviously not part of the well-known port range. What is this for? Well, network communication is a two-way street. So when I'm communicating with uh, YouTube and I'm saying, hey, I want to access your web server. I want to see some videos right now. Right now. That's going to send that video back to me. That's going to send that video back to my IP address, which if I'm only accessing YouTube, that's fine. But I'm not only watching YouTube right now. Often I'm uh, listening to Spotify. So Spotify is sending me stuff too. I'm browsing a few other websites at the same time. I mean, we all have like a million tabs open, right? So they're sending me data at the same time. I'm receiving a lot of data from a lot of different network applications. So that port number, 57,095, is kind of like my from address. When I say, hey, YouTube, send me back a video, I say, hey, send it back to me on this port so my application can get it. Because I'm doing a lot of other stuff right now. You're not the only application I'm talking to you. Sorry, YouTube. Uh, so essentially, my, my web browser pulled this number out of the air. It's temporary, often referred to as an ephemeral port. I love saying that word, ephemeral, ephemeral. Say it, say it, ephemeral, say it out loud right now, ephemeral. It's temporary. And when YouTube sends me that video, it responds back to that port, my IP address with that port. If I look back at Wireshark and I stop filtering just by YouTube traffic and I look at everything I'm talking to right now, you can see that my computer is using a bunch of different source ports. 52.0.15 for this particular server I'm talking to. 51.9.3.1 talking to this server. And here's an example of the server talking back to me on my port. So 4.4.3 talking back to my ephemeral port here. So let's walk back through what just happened with YouTube. Let me erase some stuff here. My communication with YouTube used both TCP and UDP. So after the application layer got it all pretty and ready for me boxed up with a bow on it, my web browser decided to use TCP on port 443. And we take that information, that segment, and give it to the network layer. And what does he do? Well, he handles the IP addresses. So now it kind of looks like this at this point. We have our data from the application layer. We have our layer four header from the transport layer, which basically is saying we're using TCP port 443. And the network layer is going to slap on a layer three header, turning this into a packet. And it's got a destination IP address of 173.194.191.167. Blah, blah, blah. Kind of hard to see there. <laughs> you know what it is. And then it goes on down. You know the process. If you go back and watch our previous videos, you know what happens. Oh, and of course, this layer four header also has the source port, duh, of 57095. And when it goes through the internet and finally arrives at the YouTube server and it gets to the transport layer, the transport layer will go, oh, hey, this is coming in on port 443. This is our web server. Let me hit this up to the web server application. All right, quiz time. Hope you're ready. Hope you have your coffee ready because this is gonna, gonna make you think. These questions are brought to you by Boson XM, the best practice exam software out there for any kind of Cisco, CCNA prep, CCMP prep. So if you're getting ready for your exam, you might wanna get Boson and see if you're ready. But let's see how you're doing right now. This will be a simulator question very similar to what you might see on the exam. So I'll go ahead and launch this right now. Ooh, look at this. So select the application layer protocols on the left and drag them to the corresponding transport layer protocols. All application layer protocols will be used. So I know you can't drag this with me, but write it out on a piece of paper and see what you got. Oh, and I realized that we did not talk about every single protocol here. Go research it, go figure it out. If you already know it, that's fantastic. This is your chance to learn it right now. So let's see what I know right now. DNS, that's gonna be TCP and UDP, it uses both. DHCP will be UDP. What's that port number? Let me know in the comments below. FTP, that's gonna be TCP. What was that again? Port number, 21. HTTP, it's gonna be TCP. SMTP, it's gonna be TCP. SNMP, UDP, TFTP, UDP. I would love to see you put all the port numbers to these protocols in the comments below. Let's see if I got it right. Let's show the answer here. Yeah, we got it right. All right, second and final question, which of the following ports is used by TFTP? 
select the best answer. And you would already know the protocol from the previous question, but you don't know the port number just yet. Let's see what you got. All right, time to see if I know this. I know it's gonna be UDP. That's what the Trivial File Transfer Protocol uses. And I know it's gonna be UDP port 69. Let's see if I got my answer right and correct. I got it. If you got both of those questions right, congrats. That's amazing. Like this is from Boson XM, the CCNA practice exam. It's the gold standard. If you can pass their stuff, you're pretty, you're in a pretty good spot. Many people say this is harder than the actual CCNA exam. Today we covered a lot. We saw how Johnny, when he wants to watch a YouTube video, what that looks like from the OSI model or the TCP IP model perspective. We had already covered the first three layers of the OSI model, the physical data link and network, all involving things like cables, switches, and routers. But then the upper layers we hadn't really talked about and we got to see that happen in this video. Transport, session, presentation, and application. Now I know I say this a lot in pretty much every video, but we just scratch the surface. There's a lot more to know with the TCP IP model, with the OSI model. And as we move forward in studying networking, as we go deeper into the CCNA topics, we will explore each of these more. But for now, I want you to know that this is just the beginning. I hope you're excited. I hope you're having fun. And let me know what you think about this video. Comment below. If you have any questions or need any help, don't be afraid to ask. We got a community here that's amazing. And if you wanna jump into my Discord server below, I've got a link, join the community. And if you want to help me do more of what I do here, making a free CCNA, making other free courses, along with David Bomble, consider joining the mission. This is it.io. That's the website. Go to it. It's a membership that we offer that has some pretty cool benefits along with helping us do more of this. Well, anyways, that was episode five. I'll catch you guys on episode six.